everyone, and welcome to the second episode of Spread the Tech, a series of the Digital Inclusion Exchange podcast, co-hosted by the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and Digital Charlotte. This series is brought to you through a sponsorship with Verizon to help digital inclusion practitioners adjust to the new challenges brought on by COVID-19. During this episode, Angela Seifer, Executive Director of the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, and Bruce Clark, Executive Director of Digital Charlotte, speak with Adam Elkman, the Executive Director of Libraries Without Borders, and Angelica Kluna, the Senior Electronics Program Manager of Goodwill Industries of San Antonio. During this interview, the host discuss with Adam and Angelica how Libraries Without Borders has adjusted and risen to the challenges brought on by COVID-19 on the national scale, and how partnerships with the local organizations like Goodwill Industries of San Antonio support those challenges. It is our intention that this conversation will help other similar groups learn from these two organizations and replicate some of the strategies they use. We hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome to the Digital Inclusion Exchange and our special Spread the Tech series in partnership between the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and Digital Charlotte, an initiative of the Knight School of Communication at Queen's University of Charlotte. Our hosts today are Angela Seifer uh, with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and myself, Bruce Clark, with Digital Charlotte. Uh, we have two guests today. Joining us uh, is Adam, Adam Eckelman, Executive Director. Uh, Adam leads a new partnerships and strategies to promote access to information for libraries without borders in the United States, including partnerships with libraries, small businesses, and trade associations like laundromats and public agencies. Prior to his role, Adam launched the Legal Initiative at Libraries Without Borders in order to better connect immigrants in the U.S. with legal libraries and legal librarians. A graduate of Yale University, Adam has worked with uh, Races Texas and the Carnes Detention Center as a refugee coordinator with Integrated Refugee and Immigrant Services in New Haven, Connecticut. Thanks for joining us, Adam. Also joining us today is Angelica Kluna, uh, with almost 30 years experience in consumer electronics industry and startup operations, Angelica manages Goodwill San Antonio's electronic program, providing professional services such as e-waste management, IT asset disposition, data center decommissioning, and a community-based technology access program. Each of these components are designed to fulfill our customers' needs with advancing the mission of Goodwill San Antonio. Uh, helping change lives through the power of work. Prior to joining Goodwill, Angelica pioneered wireless device reuse as one of the first resellers of paging in 1991 and data sanitation through the flash destruction to a size of less than a quarter of an inch in 2008. It says paging. I had to just double check. I was paging. Okay, cool. Uh, she, has a, she has a Bachelor of Business Administration with a major of international business from Texas a and University in San Antonio and actively participates in participates in the state of tech for recycling and one of my favorite organizations that I like to learn from a lot, the San Antonio Digital Inclusion Alliance. Thank you both for joining us today. So Adam, let's start with you jumping right in. Do you mind sharing a bit about uh, Libraries Without Borders, what you do, how you're responding to COVID-19 and your relationship with Goodwill San Antonio? Absolutely. And first off, thank you, Bruce, and thanks to the National Digital Inclusion Alliance, uh, to Angela, to Caitlin, to, to all of you for, for bringing this together. I feel really honored to be here uh, and a little bit, uh, you know, I think it's, yes, Libraries Without Borders is doing some wonderful work, um, but one theme that I want to stress uh, and we'll, you'll find will probably come up again and again is the role of partners and the role of partnerships. Uh, it's not just lip service, but stronger when we work together. Um, and I think this actually is so critical to the work of digital inclusion. Um, as Angela and, and you, Bruce, you always say, like, it, where it's a stool and there are many different people. There's access to devices, there's internet connectivity, there's digital skills. Um, and to do this effectively, we need so many people uh, working together. And that segues really nicely to, to what I do at Libraries of Borders. Sometimes I think of us as uh, the glue in between the different stool steps. Our, our mission is access to information. Um, and we focus on those who often fall between the cracks for whatever reason. 
Libraries Without Borders is an international organization and I run the US office, which is a separate 501c3. Um, and we work nationally uh, in my capacity. And often we're thinking about how to take the work that public libraries and nonprofit organizations are doing and expand the scope of their services so that it's truly accessible for everyone. Um, I often use this term, and many of you hear this, right? How do we meet people they are? And sometimes that means literally, how do we bring programs and opportunities to families? So you'll hear me talk a lot about our work in laundromats. It's a pretty concrete example of bringing services to people when they're available. But there's another side to this term. Um, because meeting people where they are also means figuring out how one person or how one family or one child interprets digital inclusion. What's relevant to them? What programs and opportunities are most interesting? When you walk in with a computer or you offer internet, what are people using that internet for? Um, and how can we, in the broader sense, meet you where you are and provide services that are most interesting to you? So to give you the big national picture of Libraries Without Borders, we start off with programs. Um, we work with a series of partners in a number of cities, San Antonio being one of them. We also work in Baltimore and Detroit, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Oakland, California, uh, and the island of Puerto Rico. Every project is really different because meeting people where they are means designing a project and a partnership that builds on the interests of communities. And that also meets our partners where they are and figures out what, what skills they have, what gaps they might be seeing right now in their services, and what goals they have internally and externally. Adam, can I ask? One of the, yeah, can yeah, ask, yeah. Can, can I ask you, so meeting folks where they are in this current environment means that they are not near other people. So how are you adjusting your work today? It's been incredibly difficult. Uh, and I think you guys have heard this again and again. Um, the bread and butter of our work is often focused on laundromats. So we operate programs in laundromats all across the US. And typically what we'll do is we'll train librarians, we'll train nonprofit organizations, we'll set up public Wi-Fi, we'll set up computers and laundromats uh, as in as a pop-up library, essentially. All the services you see in a library, you can find in a laundromat. When uh, all of the restrictions around COVID-19 team had to totally reassess how we run our programs. We're very lucky in some ways that laundromats are classified as essential businesses in nearly every state. But also, we can't expect people to be socializing and to be using these laundromat libraries in the ways that they normally would. Um, the computers that we have, just like at a library, they're not six feet away from each other. And we don't have affecting procedures that enable one person to use a device and then pass it on to another person. So we have a lot of concerns about transmission. What we realized was, rather than thinking about the specific technology or the specific uh, tech training that we've been doing historically, we, we realized that laundromats are an access point and that above all, one huge gap that we see both locally and nationally is are, are the families who are not connected. Um, many, many organizations recognize that their constituents, the people that they're serving don't have internet at home or don't have a device but the only way that they seem to know how to reach them is by using the internet. And you can't, you can't reach people who aren't online by going online. It sounds like common sense, but you know, you'd be surprised. Um, and we realized a lot of families are still going to the laundromat. And it was an opportunity to get information, get technology and get resources to people where they are. So we started a program in the past few weeks to disseminate refurbished computers and Wi-Fi hotspots and curated uh, activities curated by local librarians, um, and in some cases, free books, put them on a backpack and disseminate them through laundromats in the programs where we work. So just like you might uh, you know, walk over to the library normally and that's where you'd access the internet, in this case, we're saying, you know, we know you have to go to the laundromat, 
let's use the fact that you're already there as a space to get you that device or get you that hotspot that you need so that you can continue learning at home. Because we can't ask you to be learning in the laundromat, but we know that you still need connection at home. In addition to that, we also realized that we needed to extend public Wi-Fi. So there's really two projects. One, we're delivering uh, and distributing devices at laundromats to families. And the other one is we're expanding Wi-Fi from those laundromats into the parking lots and essentially creating, you know, public Wi-Fi learning spaces. And I suppose this is where the partnership with Goodwill San Antonio comes into place. So I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, I can, I can kick this off and, and pass it over to you, Angelica. But one thing we've been doing in San Antonio is, you know, we realized we needed um, about 100 devices to pilot this project. And we needed a supplier and a refurbisher that was local, that knew the community, and that understood um, all of the different challenges. And we reached out to Goodwill San Antonio, and Angelica and her team mobilized so quickly. Um, and so as I was thinking about our work, honestly, it can't be done without folks like Angelica. Thanks a lot. I appreciate that, Adam. Our, uh, our technology access program has been a, a, a really great way for Goodwill to support our key clients in the community. Um, as many many people know, the, the digital divide really affects the people who are um, in the low income areas, especially in San Antonio. There's a, a real geographic divide. Um, the wealthier parts of town have a significant access to devices and uh, internet capabilities in their homes, and uh, the the poorer sides of town uh, have restricted access, um, and very few of them have devices. So we actually started this program as a partnership in 2016 with the San Antonio Housing Authority um, in efforts to support their Connect Home initiative. Um, and then uh, just last year, we were able to open it directly to the public uh, through some of our workforce initiatives. Uh, we have workforce um, uh, workforce centers where people can get training, and then we also have career centers where people can get help finding a job. And the uh, team members we have at those locations have been able to identify people who are in critical need, uh, mainly because we've set up labs to help people apply for jobs online, and, and we found that that the reason people are coming in is because they don't have a device. They can't apply for a job online because they don't have a way to do that. So uh, that speared our leadership into opening this up as a program we could offer directly to individuals and extend past the, the Saha uh, agreement that we had. So we were able to partner with Libraries Without Borders and, and a few other organizations to really uh, use the devices that we get donated to us to support our community. Um, and and mm. part of the reason that we're able to do that is because of our our uh, business service side of the house. So our IT asset disposition services yields us some really nice equipment. If you can imagine, um, donated computers could be spar from consumers, but getting um, donations from from large businesses allows us to have an, a constant inflow of computers that we can refurbish and put back in the community. So in this, uh, go ahead, Angela, I'm sorry. Angelica, I was just going to ask, can you tell us a bit about the social distancing method that you're using to distribute, to, to refurbish the computers and to distribute them? Because I, I think there are some who are intimidated by that. And then because they haven't figured out how to do it, then they're not doing it. So you, because you have figured it out, it would be really super that. Sure. Um, well, so on refurbishing, we, we've well established uh, the tech space for each of our technicians. So they typically have about 12 linear feet of tech bench space. So the spacing for the technicians to work was already uh, in compliance with the social distancing. Um, the the distribution of the devices was much more challenging. So we have our inventory space that's that's slightly away from where the technicians are, and one person moves product from technicians to inventory, and then a different person will pull inventory for orders, and we basically prepare it, put it on a cart. It's boxed up uh, with paperwork. We schedule a curbside pickup, 
and the client comes within a certain time frame to pick up their device and uh, they show up outside, they text us that they're here, almost like when you're picking up your food, they text us that they're here. We run out there with the, with the computer on a cart and, uh, and we step back, they sign the paperwork and take the computer and then we step forward and, and grab the paperwork and come back inside. It's, it, I, when we built it, the model, it seemed like, oh, this is, this is going to be complicated. It's probably going to take about 15 minutes per customer. Let's plan no more than four an hour just so we don't have any, any issues with you know, gatherings of too many people. It literally took less than five minutes. Every customer that everyone that comes to pick up, it's less than five. We're still limiting to only four pickups an hour because we want to make sure that depending on how people arrive, that we don't get too many people standing around waiting. Uh, but we are scheduling every pickup too. We're not allowing people just to show up. Um, so that allows us to provide the distancing also that's required. Um, starting Monday, we'll actually, Texas has opened up our retail operations. So we'll be able to open our walk-in operations for people to get uh, computers. Um, and in order to address that, we are limiting our hours and limiting ourselves to only two people in our store at a time. So uh, we're definitely promoting the curbside as the other option uh, to to provide more access to people, but but then the the uh, the store being open is 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 the second option. So, Adam, same question. How are you? So you you all are receiving the devices from Goodwill, putting them in the back with the other materials. Talk us through what that looks like. How do families know to come pick them up and things like that? Yeah, yeah that's a great question. Um, we rely again a lot on partners uh and so in our laundromats we have we work with the staff that's there who are because those laundromats are essential businesses they're essential workers and it's kind of a it's a win-win we see um they're trying to promote their business they're trying to show themselves not just as you know a profit making group but also as a community oriented business and so what we can do is say hey for those loyal customers that you have and folks that we already know and have identified um, are in need of a device, um, this is an additional incentive you can provide. So for those families that are coming in, they sign up in advance and they actually just text the, the manager and then they arrange for the pickup. Um, we also expanded to the, fan, the San Antonio Food Bank. So we realized that laundromats were one space, but it wasn't necessarily the only one. Um, and we wanted to um, broaden the scope of distribution um, because not everybody goes to the laundromat and many families right now don't feel safe going to a laundromat, which is totally reasonable. So they're washing their clothes at home. And we had to ask ourselves um, if one of the roles that Libraries of Borders can play is, is uh, connecting and focusing on access, who are we still lacking? And so... That's how we ended up reaching out to the food bank um, and they are doing a very similar process. So as folks come in and are getting uh, food and, and resources, uh, with that can come a backpack. Uh, and that includes, as I said, a refurbished computer, hotspot, and a number of curated educational exercises. So you said a hotspot. So talk to us about that. Are you getting them? How are you getting them? Are you able to still get them? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. And that is the question of the year, uh, it seems. <laughs> so we've got uh, one order in right now. So right now we don't have hotspots like a lot of folks. We're struggling to get them. Um, we are hoping to have more hotspots to supply um, for each of the devices in the next few weeks from Mobile Beacon. But as you guys probably know, their inventory is uh shot right now uh and there's a pretty there's a very long waiting list um creative uh there's a couple ways that we're being creative one is through our partnership with google fiber um, we're very lucky that one of the distribution sites that we use is right within google fiber service area um, and much of our work has always been sponsored and supported by google fiber so we have a really close relationship with our team there um, and so one of that, one of the food distribution sites is actually blocks away from the laundromat and it's within Google fiber service area. So we're working with them to connect people to, um, some of their benefits for low income families. Um, they have a particular service plan outside of that. 
we're trying to be really creative. Um, so we've been talking to a number of uh, cellular network providers about distributing cheap phones, which can only be activated as hotspots. Uh, many of you might have heard of this. It's kind of a backup that we're exploring right now. Um, so the honest truth is right now our kits just have computers um, and we're hoping to get those hotspots in the next few days. Um, if indeed the supply remains low as we expect it might, then we're going to have to get creative. So that means having guides on how to use Google Fiber. Um, that means inserting cell phones and seeing if we can use those. And truly, I think much to the culture of libraries of upwarders, like we're open to every and all options. I often say, you know, we throw everything at the board and we see what sticks. Adam, what about the other internet service providers? Why only Google Fiber as a, as a wireline solution? That came to mind for us, um, and this is right, this is a project that we've rolled out in the past few weeks. So gotcha. we haven't been able to build the strong relationships with the other groups. Um, but honestly, it's an open call. Uh, okay. And while our partnership is closest with with Google Fiber, at the end of the day, you know our end goal is connecting families, and we know that yeah. we can't just get this. You also need connectivity. One uh, one Drum solution that we uh, is kind of our last case is to just connect people to those public Wi-Fi spaces. So as I mentioned earlier, we are expanding the Wi-Fi from the laundromats into the parking lots. So there's a world in which you know these kits only include a, a computer, some curated educational activities, and then a database or kind of a, a printed document that says here's where you can access public Wi-Fi. Um, in Texas, we're very lucky that a lot of folks have cars, not everybody, um, but we can feasibly say, drive up to the laundromat, hang out in the parking lot, and bring out your device. In other cities where we work, that is not an option. So why, so the, the internet service providers that have the free and low cost offers right now, yeah. is there a thought process behind not leading people to those? Is, or do you have concerns about those? I do have a number of concerns around um, leading folks to, to the existing offers. I mean, the issue, um, as you guys know, is we get a lot of varying accounts on the effectiveness. Um, it's so... You know, I should say, like, our number one option is hotspots. Um, our number two option is connecting folks to existing uh, service lines, whether that's Google Fiber or another carrier in the city. Um, and option three is pointing folks towards public Wi-Fi. Gotcha. Okay. Super. Thank you. How are you expanding the internet outside of the laundry Mats. I mean, this is my understanding. This would be the service of that particular business. And so mm -hmm. who I, I, I'm, I'm imagining there's another partner that's helping, yeah. helping there. But what, what does that look like? And, and how, how did you all help them do that? How far is it going? What's the what does that look like? When it comes to the, you know, I think, again, partnerships have a number of different levels to them. So partnering with a a small business, partnering with a large corporation, partnering with a nonprofit, everyone has its own set of challenges. Um, when it comes to our laundromats in San Antonio, we work with one, uh, there's a kind of a, a general owner who owns all the laundromats in the city by and large. Uh, and he's been very generous uh, throughout this process. So he's provided some funds in kind, helped us set up our initial media centers and all of the laundromats. When we came to him a few weeks ago, the idea of expanding Wi-Fi, he said, I'm happy to do it in a small set of pilot locations where you guys are already working. I'm nervous about doing it uh, on a citywide basis because I fear that this would encourage loitering. Mm. And we said, great, we'll do it on a small pilot and we're going to show you why this is valuable on a citywide basis. And so that's part of the proof of concept. And this gets to a larger, um, I think one of the larger things that I've been looking at over the past few weeks, everything that we pilot in San Antonio and all of the kinks that we're working out, 
whether that's what to do when we don't have hotspots, whether that's um, just each of those lessons learned uh, need to be scaled. So on a macro level, what I've been doing, you know, when this first happened, we focused in on two of our cities. As I mentioned, we work in many different cities across the U.S. We focused in on Baltimore and on San Antonio for a number of reasons, but mostly because that's where we have the highest capacity. And as we were rolling out projects there, um, distributing devices, extending the Wi-Fi and the laundromats, I've been keeping pace with all of our partners nationwide and asking a very explicit question. What do you want to see from our pilot in San Antonio? What do you want to see from our pilot in Baltimore to your city? And what I'm hearing from most of our partners is as much data as you can possibly get. Hmm. And more than the data, just the know-how. Normally, when, when we're thinking about scaling a project from pilot to you know, nationwide, it's all about data. But lately, people are funders and just partners in general are saying, we'll let the data slide. Just tell us how to do it. So, mm. for instance, I was talking with a, a large public library system in the Midwest uh, where they were explaining that they also want to do kits. And they, you know, we're not the first, we're not the first organization to come up with this idea, but we're one of the earliest ones to actually roll it out. And there's a lot of pieces, as you guys have brought up, that make kits complicated. We're trying to time, do we have the device and the hotspot? We're also trying to get curated resources, and a lot of that's changing very rapidly. And there's little things too, like um, we ordered our first set of computers uh, with, Ange with um, Angelica's help, and they didn't have webcams. And we realized that particularly now, having a webcam is a huge deal. So we're trying to work around that and figure out if we can get additional cams and add them as an app. Um, but it's tricky. And as we sort out the kinks with Angelica and her team at, at Goodwill, this gives us a proof of concept that we can share with so many other libraries, with so many other partners. Because they want to know, we're not the first ones who have computers without webcams, for instance. Yeah. On that, on that point, Angelica, you know, we, I'm sitting here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We've been at Goodwill of the Southern Piedmont uh, uh, doing some great work as well. Is there a mechanism for uh, the Goodwills across the country to be sharing these best practices? And I'm not aware that our, and I mean, they could be doing this, but I'm not aware that our Goodwill is yet doing um, what you're what you're all doing in San Antonio. Um, and so one, I mean, just being here is a great, so I can take that idea back to them and call them after this call and see what's going on with that and how they might learn from you. But is there some network of sharing that's going on to, to help that? Yes. So Goodwills, as you mentioned, are all, all independent, right? They all operate in their own little um, service areas. And the the two sides of the of the business I run for Goodwill, the electronics recycling, IT disposition, and then the redistribution of the refurbished equipment in the electronic store, um, are are not really both in many Goodwills. There's actually only two Goodwills that are doing this right now. It's us in um, Orange County, California. Um, and, and I'm not even sure Orange County has a, a specific technology access program. I know they are selling refurbished devices. There are a lot of Goodwills that do refurbishing their Microsoft registered refurbishers. They refurbish and put Windows 10 on computers and sell them in their stores. Um, and I've, I've, I've worked with our overseeing body, the Goodwill Industries International, to try and identify them and partner with them and, and build some uh, best practices. But it's very challenging when you don't have the right inflow, inflow of product, right? Yeah. So a Goodwill that doesn't have an IT asset disposition or e-waste management operation is going to be at the mercy of what a consumer would donate to them. And that's a much harder product to refurbish, um, not only from the standpoint of the condition of the product itself, but just the variety. So when you're working with a, a large organization, they're going to give you 500 laptops and there's going to be three models. Yeah. To refurbish those is much easier than when you're getting... 500 different models from 500 different people. <laughs> um, so I think those two have to really balance each other for it to be effective. Um, and I think, I think that 
the Goodwills can continue to provide refurbished devices, but I don't know if they can scale at the level of supporting a community um, in the way we have without having that back end supply. What would be, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Just wanted to add, San Antonio is also unique in that you have a strong digital inclusion network. So can you talk about the influence and you know how it has impacted your work? It is really, um, really nice that we have a digital inclusion alliance that it was born in about 2016. Uh, we have the, the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas uh, that has done quite a few studies on the digital divide in, in South Texas and in our area. And they were able to do some publications and present those to our community, which got the attention of a lot of people in our community. Um, so the unique part of San Antonio, I think that makes it an, an excellent um, uh, uh, boiling pot for, for digital inclusion is that we have this huge growing cybersecurity tech community and how we support the military bases and our, our education systems. And then we have this huge need on the, on the level of poverty we have and the level of disconnected people in our our, in our community. And so the city sits there in the middle and they say, boy, we need to be a smart city because of, of all we're doing with cybersecurity and, and, and biomedical research and these types of things. But then they're realizing they have a huge part of their community that's left out. So um, what we're seeing right now is, is a big push from our city office of innovation. They've actually created a the city itself, city of San Antonio has created a digital inclusion task force separate from the digital inclusion alliance. And it's uh, supported by our uh, cyber community. It's supported by our um, ed education office. And it's it's something we meet every single week and talk about how we can adjust and, and affect the uh, the inclusion of our, our people, especially during this, this COVID crisis, but even going further than that. So it's, I think, I think it's the balance. I think it's because of the, the extreme amount of, um, of IT and tech happening. And then that poverty we have. I also wonder if it has something to do with the, some of the, the personalities, the, the people who are sitting at the city, right? Because you have individuals who see it. They see the yeah. connection between all that security and smart city work and that technology needs to be for all. And I don't know that everybody has that understanding at the city level like you all do. Can you talk a little bit about the survey that the city is doing that was the survey itself was being influenced by that digital inclusion coalition? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the first thing they came out with the tax force was they wanted to understand what resources were out there so they could figure out how they needed to support or facilitate filling the gaps. So uh, we met on the task force and kind of drafted some some questions that they answered as to, you know, who's serving who, what what uh, what part of digital inclusion are they serving, what resources do they offer the community, what do they need. Um, what impacts are they making? How long have they been doing this? And uh, the survey went out about two weeks ago. Uh, we got our first update this week on the responses. So it's been uh, been very, very engaging. And I, I think it's interesting, Angela, that you you talked about our city. I, I can't say enough good things about our city uh, managers and our city departments and, and the things they're doing. I feel very honored to be a, a part of it and, and to have them leading us. Uh, what they're doing through this crisis has been really inspirational. Well, I, I was curious about what, where the devices that are going to Libraries Without Borders, where would they be going if they weren't going there? And when was the decision made to open? Was that a COVID-related decision or had that already been in the pipeline? So um, when we started this program, when we started working with Saha, we, we were this... Um, back end operation. So we worked in the background and we uh, did not have a public facing uh, uh, distribution. January of last year, we finally uh, were able to open a public facing electronic store, which allowed us, our team, to actually have technicians and qualified people talking to individuals to identify what they need and, and provide them the right product and allowed us to really produce more product and put it back out in the community. So. 
when we opened our store, that's really what triggered off our technology access program's growth. Um, so partners like Libraries Without Borders, we also partner with um, several several other nonprofits that have uh, different or related missions, right? So um, a lot of our partners are education-based. They provide education services, and they have students now that they used to provide in a classroom setting, and they have to provide online. So we've uh, met that need. Uh, we have a lot of employment partners, so people who are out helping people with um, job search and careers and those kinds of things that we've been able to help support with devices. Um, our goal is to put as many as we can and back into our product doesn't warrant that if it's not a good enough condition or if the demand isn't there, which we haven't seen yet. But if the demand weren't there, uh, we would we would find ways to reuse the product elsewhere. So like a wholesale option or something like that. Mm. I, th I think one interesting point to add, like when I look at the work with Libraries Without Borders and our partnership with Goodwill San Antonio, in some ways, we're just a drop in the bucket, you know. Angelica has a whole set of partners that are all requesting this, including, you know, community members that are going directly to Goodwill and soliciting, you know, and, and, and buying refurbished devices themselves. I think what, what has been so inspiring and great about our partnership with Goodwill San Antonio is that is your flexibility to move quickly and to think both short-term and long-term. So, you know, we started off with them just purchasing 10 devices and saying, we're going to try to come up with some creative distribution models for these 10 devices. And we're going to troubleshoot with you guys. And we're going to see what works, what doesn't work. What are the things that we're getting feedback from? Um, and who are we giving these to? And what kind of complaints are we getting? And then we're going to scale that out and build that out as we, as we, move along. That flexibility and that ability to innovate is core to what, to what I get to do at Libraries Without Borders. Often, you know, we're, we're of um, refurbished devices. Nationally, we're by no means the largest uh, space for public access computers. You know, most, most people go to the public library if they're looking for a public access computer. The, the laundromat is a very small drop in the bucket. And in the same way, you know, the 100 devices that we're distributing through Goodwill San Antonio, it's, it's a very small, but what we aim to do with this partnership, with our work in laundromats and, and organizationally, is to create a little bit of a movement for, for folks to be not just about the individuals who might be already going to Goodwill or the students that are already plugged into resources, but to be thinking about those who aren't and the general public that may not be aware of the opportunities and the resources at Goodwill San Antonio and other organizations. So I, yeah, I like that a lot, Adam. I think that, that the unique part of San Antonio and, and, and like you guys mentioned, everybody's trying to find, um, find a way to connect people, but they're all doing it online. And then when you bring in Libraries Without Borders, it's actually on the front lines talking to people and providing it. That's that's a huge impact because not everybody can do that, right? Um, whenever I partner with a with another organization, unless they have a, a, a customer-facing front-end item, they're kind of in the same place we are. They're identifying people through demographic models and and connecting with them online, and, and then they're trying to figure out how to distribute it, right? So I think... I think because of the geography of San Antonio being so large and the 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 need being so big that that uh, it's going to require multiple partners. It's going to require more than we can imagine of people working towards this goal so that we can we can connect everybody. So we've been hearing from some of our other nonprofit refurbishers here in North Carolina uh, that you know just like the hotspots are really hard to get many of their uh, the supply chain that was providing these um, laptops to these refurbishers are also having less and less because they're having to give them to their employees who need to work remotely. And so there's, you know, hopefully on the backside of this, there's like truckloads of laptops being dropped <laughs> off. But are you also sort of a sort of a two part question? Like what? Well, maybe not. Are you seeing a reduction in the in the amount of devices that are coming in the back door, so to speak? And, and how do you imagine that impacting our ability or your ability to continue to service through the technology access program? That is a very good question. So um, 
you know, in Texas, our stay home work orders uh, uh, went in place on March 23rd. And so we had not done pickups from our business customers, our business donations since March 23rd. So over a month's worth of not picking up any devices and working our back stock of inventory, um, we we did have some time when we were closed there that will allowed us to to buy some time right for production um and then we are we are running close to lower on our laptops um i think our strategies and i i spoke with um with lisa at libraries without borders yesterday about it our our strategies are are going to be to maybe look at desktops are they an option right are we identifying that that this end user really is going to use this device at home and granted the whole uh, logistics of getting it to their home may be a little bit harder but it's going to be available now not not while everybody's waiting for a laptop right uh we have a significant volume of desktops i think most of your other nonprofit refurbishers would tell you the same that that desktops and lcd monitors and keyboards and mice are available uh in in large volumes and if people can can find ways to deploy those to their residents that they can use in their homes hopefully they have wi-fi in their home then that's going to be a solution in the short term uh i did look at some industry uh trends which which are not going to yield well for the laptop and desktop new purchasing are both considered to be down for 2020, which means we won't be getting those used ones, mm-hmm. right? So the used ones are in service longer, uh, meaning we will have less of uh, those coming to mm-hmm. us. So. I want to just quickly add one new element here, which is which is a digital skills piece. We've been talking a lot about access and how to get devices out. Um, we've talked a little bit about hotspots and internet connectivity, There's a third piece, right? And that is how do we also ensure that those who have devices know how to use them and are are supported in setting up those devices. So like historically at laundromats, we bring in librarians who do one-on-one tech support in person. We can't do that anymore. And so as we at Libraries Without Borders started distributing these these kits um, and laundromats in partnership with the San Antonio Food Bank, in partnership with Goodwill San Antonio, we realized we need uh, new resources. Uh, and one thing that's been emerging on a national level is uh, a demand for a hotline, tech support, call-in services. And I just want to wanna highlight a couple of things. First of all, the work that Angelica and her team have been doing to expand uh, their hotline and their, their tech support services, and also the work of some of our other partners. So we work really closely with... Uh, the San Antonio County, which is called Bear County, uh, and their all digital public library known as Bibliotech. And they have been, they have offered to help us set up a, uh, a referral and a tech support hotline so that we can distribute a device to a family at a laundromat at a food bank, um, you know, a device from Goodwill San Antonio. And then they have a number to call so that when that device doesn't turn on or when they need help installing those webcams, they can actually talk to someone. Hmm. Angela, it sounds, uh, sounds like a digital navigator, perhaps. It does sound like digital <laughs> navigators. That's, that's the term we've thrown on it, but really it's the same idea all over, which is that you have to have, have to use phones these days in order to provide tech support. Um, so Adam, with, with how you've set that up, it, is it um, folks calling into a hotline and then they someone takes a message and then someone else calls them back? Or do they, when they call into the hotline, is that the person that assists them? So it's definitely emerging. <laughs> um, what, what we're doing right now is it's, it's, it's honestly, a, it's a do what we can when you can. We have a tech in-house funded through the Media Democracy Fund and They've been taking some of some of the calls. Uh, others we can we can circuit through Goodwill San Antonio, um, and we're still building out the system through Bibliotech. But I think it does underscore that there's a huge need for digital navigators. Um, I, as I mentioned, you know, I, I work nationally, and in the city of Baltimore, we see the same problem, and we've been working with them on a coalition-wide basis to figure out. Um, a set of volunteers who could help staff a tech hotline from nine to five, but that's, it's a pretty, it's a pretty high investment, honestly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're thinking about, we do open office hours with a a video or a phone 
uh, and we offer it in English and Spanish right now. And it's it's just been uh, limited hours, but open. So we communicate a lot with our our partners and um, and trying to get the word out. But same thing is trying to figure out how do you provide that service more broadly and get the word out and have people feel trust in in calling that number that they're going to talk to somebody and get an sense to them. So, uh, but we are, we are approaching our time here. So I do want to be respectful. I'm sure there is a room that you have to go jump on immediately after <laughs> this one. Um, so, but uh, just real quick, do either of you have any sort of parting words, anything that we didn't ask you that you would like to um, say before we jump off and Angela, uh, any, anybody say? No, I really appreciate the partnership with libraries without border and, borders and being able to share this with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and Digital Charlotte. I think there is so there are so many things we can do together to help bridge this divide. And just talking about it, I think, and sharing the best practices is, is great. So I appreciate you inviting me. Great. Yeah. Thanks for being here. I, I want to just give a quick nod to some of the funders, particularly Google Fiber, but also the San Antonio Area Foundation. Um, in part because what I've seen Seen in the past few months is a lot of folks who recognize the value not only of digital inclusion but also of risk taking. Um, a lot of what we're doing right now is it's a little bit uncharted territory. Um, so many of you have probably read, you know, schools, particularly city schools, around us to get Chromebooks typically to students. That's an amazing effort, and I'm like, we're we're such huge fans of that. But um, it's, it's harder to reach those who have, as I said, fallen between the cracks. You know, uh, returning citizens, adults, learning adults, uh, youth who, for whatever reason, uh, don't qualify. And for that group, I've just, I've been so impressed by the community of partners like Goodwill San Antonio and by foundations that have been able to say, you know, try something out. Experiment with laundromats, try food banks, figure out how you can reach people. Um, and tell us what you learn. And so I think that that culture is a silver lining of this crisis, honestly. Um, for so many, this is a really dark moment, but um, I, I feel really grateful to be surrounded by organizations that are willing to take a risk and try and who care about this issue. Fantastic. Well, Adam, Angelica, Angela, th thank you. All three A's, I just realized that as I said that together. <laughs> And yet Thank we you. Can talk to you, Bruce. C. <laughs> I'm, but I'm B and C, so you guys are all A's, and then I got it's all, all, all makes sense, right? Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for joining the Digital Inclusion Exchange and our special Spread the Tech series in partnership with the National Digital Inclusion Alliance and Digital Charlotte Initiative of the Knight School of Communication at Queen's University of Charlotte. So, thank you all for joining us. Thanks, thank everyone. you. Thank you.